Disaster has many forms and it is part and parcel of human life. You could, for example, get life-threatening cancer. That's a personal disaster, is it not a calamity? You could lose your work. Your child could become a drug addict. Your marriage could fall apart. There are endless examples of personal disaster that can strike in our lives. There is also public disaster. 21 years ago today, America was struck by disaster. Two planes flew into the Twin Towers in New York. One plane flew into the Pentagon. Another plane crashed. A total of 2,996 people were killed in the terrorist attack. This morning, as I prepare the sermon, an earthquake of the magnitude of 7.6 struck Papua New Guinea and property was damaged. Panic has spread among the residents. Now, in each instance of disaster, whether it's personal disaster like cancer or dismissal, or whether it's public disaster like a terrorist attack or an earthquake, we know this, that God knew of it before it happened. God is omniscient, which means He's all-knowing. If you think about it, there's no point in having a God who can be surprised by human events. God knew from day one that the terrorists were planning to attack the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. He knew that 2,996 people would die and he knew each one of them personally. Yet God did not intervene. So what do you and I do with that? With that reality that that God knew but he did nothing now people struggle with this some people ascribe it to Satan they they say that Satan somehow gets an advantage and the problem with that kind of thinking is it means that Satan can get the upper hand on God which is not possible biblically even in Satan's most defining moment the murder of Jesus Christ on the cross you and I know that God was in control in every sense. Some people say, to try and explain the conundrum, that, that God is limited by our choices. And he is a gentleman and we gave Satan authority, so now God can do nothing. Now, with all due respect, that gentleman God is not biblical and such a God is simply useless. In the book of Job we learn quite clearly that Satan cannot act outside of what God allows. And I know it's a difficult book to deal with, but it teaches us quite clearly that Satan is limited and cannot act outside of what God allows. And so to blame Satan for everything without considering why it was allowed by God is to be, unfortunately, childish in faith. Our God is a Father and He remains in control always. And so what must we do when disaster strikes? How must we react to personal or public disaster? And I'm going to answer this question by referring you to the Bible. And I'm going to give you, in other words, the Bible's opinion. But here's a summary. When disaster strikes, more than ever, we must engage in humble self-examination. And we may then end up in a place of having to repent, or maybe not, but we will always allow our self-reflection to issue into praise. The bottom line is that when personal or public disaster strikes, we must discern. And there are three principles I want to highlight before I close. The first principle is this, that disaster may actually be personal in this sense. It may be judgment or discipline for sin in my life. In John chapter 5, the man's illness, we read, was caused by his sin. In Hebrews chapter 12, we are told that God disciplines his children, believers. He disciplines them. And in Romans chapter 1, we are told that judgment is already playing out on the wicked. So if you put those three texts together, John 5, Hebrews 12, and Romans 1, you come to our first principle, that disaster may actually be personal in the sense that it may be judgment 
or discipline for sin in my life. And for that reason, you need to self-reflect about why the disaster has happened. Here's the second principle. Disaster may not be personal. It may just be there to create the opportunity for God to be glorified. Here the text is John chapter 9. And in John chapter 9 verse 3, Jesus explains that the man there was blind not because of his sin or his parents' sin, but to display the works of God. In other words, his blindness was an opportunity for God to display his glory. And what that means is that in your life it may be so that the disaster is there to create an opportunity for God to do his specific purposes. Thirdly, the last principle Disaster may simply be an overflow of a fallen world. In other words, a consequence of man's disobedience. All right, so it's, again, and the third one's also not personal. It, it's not specific, but what it's saying is the disaster may just be general in nature because of the fallen nature of mankind. And this is what Jesus explains to us in Luke chapter 13. If you go there, Jesus discusses the incident of Herod mixing the blood of of Galileans with the blood of sacrifices and Jesus also discusses the incident where the Tower of Siloam fell killing 18. And what Jesus does there is to warn us not to try and assign such incidents to the sin of others. In other words, you could come into the place where a disaster happens and you say, oh well, you see they, 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 they're suffering now because of what they did wrong. And Jesus warns against that. It's like looking for splinters in the eyes of others when you have a beam in your own. Rather, back to the principle I've already stated, Jesus said, you and I must take to self-reflection. When we hear of a public disaster, it should push us into a place of self-reflection. We should consider our own mortality. We should consider how fragile we are and how vulnerable we are. And we should reflect on the sin in our own lives and repent. So that was the third principle. Disaster may simply be an overflow of a fallen world, but it should take us again to self-reflection and not to judgment on others. So in short, whatever the disaster, whether it's personal or not, our response should always be humble self-examination, deep reflection, repentance, and praise to a God who still holds the world in His hands. I close in Nahum chapter 1 verse 3, we read the following beautiful words. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. We should reflect deeply on Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. You see, when you read that, you, you understand that our God is gracious, but he is also just. There is a tension in the character of God. And sinners like you and me can only bridge that tension through Jesus Christ who takes our sin upon himself. Because God will not let sin go unpunished. Let me say that again. God will not let sin go unpunished. The greatest disaster that can befall any human being is to come to the end of his or her life without having made right with God for their sin through Jesus Christ. Such a person, such an unrepentant person, reaps the eternal whirlwind and storm of God's judgment and wrath. And that storm, that whirlwind, is called hell. And no disaster on earth compares to the tyranny, the pain and the suffering of hell. And in that sense, every earthly disaster that brings us to self-reflection and repentance is pure grace. Because that grace keeps us from the eternal whirlwind and storm of God's judgment. May God grant you deep insight and understanding to be able to reach a point and conclusion of what you need to repent of if necessary and bring you into a place of praise and bring you into a place of a humble servant to, to allow God to use your situation for His glory. We pray this in Christ's name.
Amen.